Okay, so here's the Earth. Around the equator, 24,900 miles, give or take, about 25,000 miles around the equator. How big is 25,000 miles, you say? Well, this is Usain Bolt, as far as we know, the fastest person who has ever lived, at least in a short distance. I mean, look at him. He's looking at the camera and smiling <laughs> as he's pulling away from the fastest people on the planet. His, his top speed is about 27.8 miles per hour. Okay, most of you exceed that driving down 12th Street. <laughs> but for a human being running, that's pretty fast. If somehow he could maintain that pace, the fastest a person has ever run, if he could maintain that for 24,900 miles, you know how long it would take him to go around the earth? 37 days, eight hours, over a month, running the fastest a person has ever run. We're gonna have to pretend that there's some sort of bridge over the oceans or something. We spent trillions of dollars to build it so we could test this out, all right? This is the Hennessy Venom GT. It's the fastest car we've ever built that's not like powered by rockets or something, all right? This thing can travel 303 miles per hour. It's pretty fast. If that were to drive on our trillion dollar bridge around the equator, it would take three days and 10 hours. And there would probably need to be a few fuel stops along the way. 303 miles an hour, it would take three days to circumnavigate the globe. This is the uh, fastest rocket that's ever had a human being inside of it. And we're not talking about a space shuttle re-entering the Earth's atmosphere from space. Those are moving pretty fast, but they're also descending. If we wanted to fly a rocket around the Earth, the fastest rocket we've ever had, Traveled 4,473 miles an hour. That's pretty fast. It would still take five and a half hours. Think about five and a half hours. Five and a half hours from now would be like, I don't know, 4.22 or something. My math is probably bad on that. That's a while at 4,000 miles an hour to get around our Earth because our Earth is actually not a small piece of material. The speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. That's moving. To travel around the Earth, it would take one-seventh of one second. In fact, in one second, if light somehow were bending around and flying on our little highway, it would fly around the Earth in one second, seven and a half times. At 186,000 miles per second, that's pretty fast. As we look at the scope of what I'm going to show you, what I want you to continually think about is, wow, that's big. But think about the God that created that really big thing and how much bigger he might be. This is the planet Jupiter. You can see the, the giant red spot there, the great red spot. I'll point it out to you. No, nope. Here we go. Right there. It's actually shrinking. It used to be three times that size when we first started looking at it. It's kind of a mystery. But right next to it, you see that right there? That's North America. That's a big planet. <laughs> its giant red spot, even though it's a third of the size it used to be, is still as big as our entire planet. And there's a God that created that who spoke it into existence. This is our sun. Do you know how many Earths you could fit across the middle of it? 109. That's a big star right there, and it's not even really that big. It's bigger than 80% of them, but there are some big stars out there. It is 93 million miles away, and light takes eight minutes to travel from that star to us. At 186,000 miles per second, seven and a half times around the Earth, it takes eight minutes for that light to get to us. 
from our closest star that can really make us warm in August. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take about eight minutes just to get an idea of how far that is. We're going to spend the next eight minutes in silence so you can sense how awkward eight minutes is. <laughs> we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. <laughs> but eight minutes, that's a while. At 186,000 miles a second, 93 million miles from that star to us. This is the Milky Way. This is not a photograph. If we wanted to photograph this, we would have to send up a special satellite with propulsion that could send it at a light speed, and it would take hundreds of thousands of years to get far away enough to take this picture. So this is an artist's rendering of the Milky Way. It's 100,000 light years across. Think about this for a second. If light left over here and wanted to travel all the way over here, for those of you sitting on my right, that, that journey would take 100,000 years. At light speed, 186,000 miles per second, seven and a half times around the Earth in one second. 100,000 years. If the Milky Way were this room, everybody just kind of imagine the disk of the Milky Way filling this room right now. The distance from the Earth to the Sun, remember that? It takes eight minutes at light speed, 93, eight, 93 million miles. If this were the Milky Way, the distance between the Earth and the Sun would be one and a half times the width of DNA. The distance between the Sun and the Earth. The Sun itself would be a quarter the diameter. Now remember, the diameter is 109 Earths. If this room were the Milky Way, the Sun itself would be a quarter of the diameter of a hydrogen atom. That's a big galaxy and an even bigger God that created it. Does anybody recognize this constellation? That's Orion, yeah. The middle star in Orion's belt there is called Alnilum. I apologize to any cosmologists or astronomers in the room if I mispronounced that. That's called Alnilum. It's 2,000 light years away. So the light that you look at, every time you look at Orion, and you look at that middle star in his belt, the light that you're seeing left that star when Jesus was in his 20s. 2,000 light years away, if this were the Milky Way in this room, you know how far away Al Nilam would be in our own little neighborhood? It'd be about 16 inches away. And actually, here's the center of the Milky Way somewhere in the middle of this room. I'd be standing about where we are, and that star, 16 inches away. That's how massive just our galaxy is. This is our neighbor, the Andromeda. It's barreling towards us, and in four billion years, it's actually going to pass right through us, and then they're going to do this little dance and combine into one, like, super galaxy. So... Look out, four billion years from now, it's going to get intense. <laughs> the Andromeda galaxy is 220,000 light years across. It's one of the dozen largest galaxies that we know of. So if light wanted to travel from one side of the Andromeda galaxy to the other, it would take 220,000 years, 186,000 miles a second. This is Hercules A. This is the second largest galaxy we've ever seen. I chose this one because the largest galaxy we've ever seen is really boring. It's just this white cloud because it's really far away. But this is Hercules A. It's 1.5 million light years across. This is just a neighborhood. And to get from one side to the other, traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, it would take one and a half million years. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? 
the creator of all of this is really big, isn't he? <laughs> really big. When he was on this earth, Jesus had a best friend or one of his closest friends. His name was John. And just as an example of how close they were, this is at the Last Supper, reclining on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. That was John. That's how he talked about himself because he didn't want to insert his own name. So Simon Peter, who's the rock and everything, he's asking John, tell us who it is of whom he is speaking. Jesus had just said, one of you will betray me. So leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? These guys were close. They had a very close relationship. This same John, later in life, decades later, is exiled to an island off of Turkey called Patmos. And he, he writes a letter that we have called Revelation. And he said that as he was on that island, all of a sudden he was in the spirit and he had these visions. And one of the visions he had was of his old friend Jesus. And this is what John said. After he sees Jesus and he's like shining and John's even just trying to give us an idea of what Jesus looks like, but it's over-the-top, ridiculous glory and splendor. You can read about it in the passage that we have in there, but the end of that passage is this right here. When I saw him, I, his best friend, fell at his feet like a dead man. Because this enormous creator all of a sudden is standing in front of him, and it's like, I don't know. He's my best friend? No, he's the creator. He's huge. Here's the nice thing, though. Jesus placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and of Hades. It's nice to know that this great big God is on our side. That's, he loves us. That's, that's good news. But he's still God. He's still really big. This is the most fundamental truth in the universe, okay? God is God, and we are not. Also in Revelation, another vision that John had was of four living creatures each of them having six wings and full of eyes around and within. All day and night, they do not cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. They do not cease to say this, and they've been singing it for a long time. Hundreds of years earlier, Isaiah had a vision, and he's taken up in heaven. Guess what they're singing up there? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. So, this raises the question, what does holy mean? Set apart, I think a lot of you are probably thinking that in your head, but what does holy mean in English? Different, okay? Set apart would be the idea that here's creation, here's everything that God has made, and then here's God over in a class all by himself. There's creation, but then there's the creator, and he's different from everything else. So when the angels say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, first of all, they're repeating it three times, not to try to give us some insight into the triune nature of God. The reason they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty is because they didn't have bold face in ancient Hebrew. They didn't have italics. They didn't underline things. And so, especially in an oral tradition, are you going to say, and then the angel said, and this should be in boldface, holy is the Lord God Almighty. No, okay? It's called an emphatic repetition, and it's just saying this is really important. Holy, 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 really, really holy is the Lord God Almighty. This is actually the only attribute of God that is repeated three times. We don't see love, love, love is the Lord God Almighty. We do know that God is love. But holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. God is really, really different. This is the greatest understatement of all time. 
There is no bigger difference than between the creation and the God who created it. It's the fundamental truth of the universe. There was a time when there was no creation and there still was God. This is a different sermon for a different time, but God calls us to be holy. We're not God, but if we bring God into the picture and we recognize, here's the creator, here's everything else. If a person has the creator of the universe living inside of them, there's no bigger difference, is there? Take two people. The biggest possible difference you can have is somebody in whom the creator lives and somebody else in whom he does not. That's why it's called the Holy Spirit, eh? It's the different spirit. It's what makes us different. But God is holy. If this is the fundamental truth of the universe, what would the fundamental lie of the universe be? You can be like God. What do you know? That's the very first lie in the Bible. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die, for God knows that on the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now keep in mind, he was lying. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes. The tree was desirable to make one wise. So she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. They wanted to be wise. What's that all about? Well, (laughs) if you're not wise, if you're in this garden and you're walking with God, guess who's in charge? God's in charge. If there's an opportunity, now you're going to be wise, you're going to know the, the difference between good and evil, hey, I can start to order my life. I can start to be in charge. So this was the first lie. Things did not go well for them. As it turned out, the serpent was lying to them. They did not become like God. In fact, they were separated from him. We'll talk about that next week. But the bottom line is there's only one source of wisdom, and that's the fear of the Lord, right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and it kind of makes sense. Jesus' own best friend sees him in all of his glory, and he falls down as if dead, just terrified. It's good to fear a God that is so big. We're going to have a few implications here. If God is God and I am not, here's the couple of ways that we're going to look at that today. First, I've got some homework for you if you choose to. Write out your testimony, your faith story. Write it down. Just say, what are the key moments in my life where I grew in my relationship with God or or God was speaking to me? What is my faith story? Write it down. And then this is going to be hard. This might not be easy. Look at every event in your story and ask this question. Who was in charge? You might not like what you see, you might, all right? This is not an easy thing to do. When I did this about nine years ago, I actually came to the conclusion that I was in charge of everything. And then I came to understand, we might need to address that. (laughs) There's one other application that I think is for us here at Gateway or wherever you call home as a church. I'm going to tell, tell you about two churches that I have been connected with over the last few years. The first church, we'll call Church A, was staring at a big decision that they had to make. They had to decide whether they were going to make a big commitment, whether they were actually going to have to come up with a lot of resources to accomplish this thing. And so it's standing right there in front of their face. They didn't know what to do, but gradually, 
over the process of conversing with one another in a meeting, they came to the conclusion, you know what? As a church, we have faced all sorts of obstacles in the past. Stuff similar to this, maybe not as big, but we faced stuff, and we have always pulled through. We have always come through. So that's church A. Church B, almost at the exact same time, had to have a congregational meeting because they were facing a decision that they didn't really have a choice about. They had to come up with something like $50,000 if they wanted to hold on to their church building. And for this church of this size, that was a lot of money. Somebody stood up during that meeting and said, you know what? I don't think we can do this. <laughs> I think we need to pray and ask the creator of the universe to take care of this because we, we don't got this. And so actually a lot of people, dozens of people actually went forward and like kneeled at the front of their church and the congregational meeting turned into a prayer meeting. And over the course of the next few weeks or months, God gave them $50,000. Like there was one example where somebody, like a friend of a friend who they didn't know, a state over, contacted the church and said, I want to give you $10,000. Is that okay? Because God took care of it. Do you, do you see the contrast in the attitudes here between the two churches? Israel was at a crossroads. They were in a transition point. They were going from captivity, and most Jewish people were living in Iraq and Iran. But now they were coming back to Israel. They were coming back to Jerusalem. And the prophet Zechariah spoke to the leader, the governor of the Israelites. His name was Zerubbabel. And he prophesied, and he said, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Israel, you can try to reestablish your country by might, by power, by human ingenuity, or you can seek my spirit and my power. In light of the bigness of God, I, th I think by his spirit is a good choice. Jesus in the garden, he was talking about the vine and the branches and the, the relationship between God and his people. And one of the things he said was just really obvious. Guys, apart from me, you can do nothing. This next verse is one that almost all of you probably know by heart, and so it's probably easy to kind of miss it, because we know it. But what I'd really like to encourage you to do is as you read this next verse, try to read it for the first time. Read it with fresh eyes. Absorb everything that it's actually saying, okay? Here we go. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will direct your paths. That second line there is not something human beings practice very often. <laughs> But unless somewhere in the New Testament we've got Jesus saying, you have heard it said, do not lean on your own understanding. But I say to you, go ahead and lean on your own understanding. Unless there's somewhere where Jesus does that, this is still in effect. <laughs> it might not be what's natural to us. We might even come up with some way of like convincing ourselves, well, surely he gave me a brain for a reason. Well, sure, use that brain to, like, balance your budget. But when it comes to trying to discern the path that the people of God are to take corporately, do not lean on your own understanding. If we as Gateway or the Church in the Dalles or Eco or the American Church or the church across the world, if what we do 
from day to day and from week to week is stuff that can be accomplished by human beings, what are we doing here? Are we wasting our time? If we are leaning on our own understanding, if we're leaning on our own strength and our own ability, we might as well just be another fraternal organization. We have the creator of the universe that we claim to worship, but in our day-to-day, in our week-to-week, in the affairs of our church corporately as people of God, do we put this into practice? God is God and we are not. He is the one that is in charge, but we're so tempted, even as a group of people, to seize back control, and it's not okay. This is the structure of the universe. This is not a photograph. Again, we'd have to get way, way, way far away. So this is an illustration of the structure of the universe. And you have these like tendrils of galaxies spread all over the place. This is actually only 4% of the matter and energy in the universe, is like galaxies and stuff. And another 20% of the universe 21% is something called dark matter, and dark just means we can't see it, like light doesn't bounce off of it. And then another 75% of the universe is something called vacuum energy or dark energy. (laughs) The universe, the, the known universe that we can interact with, that we can see far, far away, 90 to 100 billion light years across. Billion light years across. The only reason we know it's that big is because we can calculate like how far things are accelerating because of that vacuum energy, because we can only see 14.5 billion years back, or 14 billion years back, okay? The universe, 90 to 100 billion light years is just the stuff that we know is there. We have no idea what's beyond that. This is AT&T Stadium in the Dallas Metroplex. It's the largest stadium in the NFL. If our universe could fit inside of that stadium, if we just shrunk the known universe, 90 billion light years across, into that stadium, which is an enormous building, You want to know how big our Milky Way would be? Think about that Milky Way that absolutely dwarfs our solar system. And now try to imagine how big the Milky Way would be in the context of the known universe. If that was the universe, the Milky Way galaxy would be one-fifth of one millimeter across. If you try to put your fingers as close as possible together, you can probably approximate one-fifth of one millimeter. Now imagine yourself doing that, and that's the vast Milky Way galaxy. If you want, you could do the Andromeda galaxy and make it two-fifths of one millimeter, okay? (laughs) Imagine yourself standing at the 50-yard line of that thing and comparing the size of the Milky Way to the known universe. That's crazy. This next slide then, this, this universe that's so big and this God that is so much bigger, this creator of the universe, this should melt our brains. We are ants on a speck that isn't even a speck. It's so small in this cosmos. And the God that created it decided to be an ant on this speck, this little blue dot in this vast universe? I don't know. (laughs) That's pretty crazy. Let's take a minute or two and just reflect on maybe what God is saying to your heart. That God is God, that we are not. Take a minute or two.